Good morning from Fresh Start. What a blessing it is to be back in the house of the Lord. We are here this morning in our Matthew study on chapter 18, and uh, we're looking for a good time in the Lord. We just ask that uh, the Lord bless and uh, open up the eyes of those. While uh, the Lord is uh, blessing and uh, while you are still looking, uh, for chapter 18, we're going to ask the Lord for his blessings. Let us bow our heads. Precious Father, we come to you thanking you for another blessed day. We ask, Father, that you'd open eyes and open ears to your word. Allow your word to land on fertile ground this morning. And, Father, we'll give you the praise and give you the glory for all things. In the precious name of Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Good to, good to have you all. Amen. Good to see everybody here this morning. What a blessing it is. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 1, and it reads, At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This question was asked by the, the, the students, uh, the disciples, uh, about whom is the greatest. And, of course, their thought were uh, down lower than God, of course. And uh, they were thinking of, of, of what man is... Uh, the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 2, And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them. 3, And he said, Verily, in other words, Truly I say unto you, Except you be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now that's a serious criteria. That criteria is that your heart needs to be like a little child. And you say, well, okay, how is it that a little child is supposed to act? Well, any time that you are giving a small person, a young person, or somebody that's uh, young in the Lord, uh, an idea, an understanding, a teaching from the Word of God, they're very attentive. They're very attentive, and they're, uh, they listen very well. And that's exactly like a little child. A little child will do the same thing. They take to heart everything that you say. And how precious are the little children uh, when they are learning something. And they want to know more. And uh, my grandchildren and children also alike uh, had many questions, many, many questions. And uh, there's nothing wrong with children asking questions. But uh, uh, be sure that you have that answer. Amen. Be sure that you have the answer. And the answer that the Lord said here, he said, uh, Truly I say unto you, except you be converted. In other words, your heart be changed from the evil of this world to that of God. So he says, except you be converted and become as little children, eager, eager to learn. How about you this morning? Are you eager to hear the word of God? Are you eager to learn God's word I, I don't know about the world, but uh, there are a chosen few that love God's Word. And, uh, you know, it directs their lives. And uh, they live by this Word. And uh, they are guided by this Word. Therefore, it, it means a lot to them uh, when the truth is brought out. And it's so important. He said, whosoever there shall, verse 4, whosoever therefore shall humble himself as a little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And to humble yourself is to, is to not try to be above your teacher or not try to be above uh, anyone else, but to humble yourself. There's something to be said about taking second seat. A lot of men and a lot of women that I know, they do not settle for the second seat. But I want to say to you this morning that if you put others first, if you put others before yourself, you can find yourself being humble before the Lord. It's very important. Now, granted, Father wants us to take care of ourselves. We have... Uh, a lot of guidance through God's Word that has taught us, hey, you need to take care of yourself. But you know, as the world teaches, the world will teach you to look out for number one. Always look out for number one. Well, what Christ is saying here is that you should put others before yourself. 
And if you can practice that and do that in a humble way, in a loving way, Father sees it. Father knows. And he loves it when you give and loves it when you teach and when you caress a young person or a young student or a young child in the Word of God to give them what they have need of. Not what they want, but what they have need of. Amen? Verse number 5. And whosoever shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now, I want to switch from the small child to a spiritual sense in a concept of knowing that when people, regardless at the age of seven or 70, if they are new to coming into the Word of God, what he says here, you shall receive such one little child in my name receiveth me. Not everybody understands the Word of God. And it's, it's, it's a proven fact. Uh, matter of fact, even in Amos 8 and 11, it tells us that there is a famine in the land today. And the famine is not of bread and water, but of the hearing of the truth of God's Word. And when somebody gets a hold of that and attaches to that, it's so important that you start out slow and that you help them along and give them what they have need of instead of trying to run over top of them and, well, uh, as one would say, uh, overload their barrel. Verse number six. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. We have laws in this world that we stand on and we know that law today is that if you hurt or uh, abuse or uh, uh, try to take advantage of a small child there's laws against that but that's not what he's talking about here what he's talking about here is is those that have just come to the understanding of the word of God they have just allowed that bud in their mind to open up. And the simplicity of God's word is coming in and filling them. Now, when you offend one of these, you say, well, what type of offense could come about for somebody that uh, uh, is young? Well, I remember as a young man of God doing my best. I was trying my best. And... Uh, These men in this church found out that I had been married before. And I want to say that first and foremost that if the marriage doesn't work out, if there is a reason for a divorcement, then therefore God is okay with that. But let me say this, that the reason why there is divorcement is because of sin. Sin has come in one way or another. So, that being known, there must be a place of repentance in the life of an individual. One must repent. I repented for my part in that marriage. But man held it against me. When one were to offend a young person that is trying to learn the Word of God because, say, they've been married before or, say, they've got uh, 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 earrings in their nose or tattoos on their face or something of that, friend, this is not the unpardonable sin. This is something that can be overlooked. Why is that? It's because we believe in repentance, true repentance. We know that when one is brought into Christ, that when one is brought forward, that they have changed their life. Their life is changed. And you should be able to see that change in their life. You should be able to recognize that there is a change in the life of an individual. 
But when you offend one of these little ones, in other words, when one is told that you can't come back here because of who you are or you can't come back here because you've been uh, uh, married before or uh, you can't come back here and listen to this because uh, uh, you've got too many questions. That, my friend, is offense. Verse number seven. This is the words of Christ in the red telex. He said, Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. It's so important. What Christ is saying here that this is needed of true teaching. You must teach the word of God with clarity and with understanding and with simplicity, even bringing it down to the first level if need to or exalting it above the third level, if need to. One must be apt to be able to teach. But what Christ is saying here, he says, Woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Because one has been teaching of a rapture theory, or an any moment doctrine, or that Jesus could come at any second. Let me ease the minds of those that do not understand. My Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, cannot come at any second. There must be things that transpire. There must be things that happen. There must be prophecy fulfilled before the coming of the Lord. Verse number 8. Wherefore... If, they hand, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better to thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Don't get yourself all tore up over this scripture. This one and the next one. I want to say here that what God Christ is trying to say is is that the body of Christ is so important and for it to be a body of Christ a body of the anointed one it means that all must correspond with one another they must be in one accord they must be agreed to how these things transpire. Now, granted, not every little detail are you going to be able to agree with on everything. But the majority, the overall plan of God, you must be able to agree with that. Meaning, if there are some of a different church that has attached themselves to the body of Christ, they teach the any moment doctrine, or they teach a rapture theory, what's he say here? He said, to cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands. What are the hands? Uh, these are those that deliver uh, the word of God. What are the two feet? The two feet are those that carry the word of God too. And so these are very important. These are very important in the ministry, even through missionary work or evangelist work. It's so important. But if they are not teaching the Word of God, the Bible tells us to discard them. Let's go on. Verse number 9. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. This of the eyes, these are what we'll call the seers, the prophets, those that are teaching the word of God. If that one that has the eye is not teaching like it should, the Bible teaches us to discard that one. Cast them from the body of Christ. 
in Ezekiel chapter 13, we use Ezekiel 13 a lot. I use it for a footnote, reason being because it is stern and it directs toward the false prophets. Ezekiel chapter 13 and verse 1, and it reads, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Now, he's talking about those that teach the word of God, but yet they want to bring out these things that are uh, in their heart. What's the world tell you to do? Oh, follow your heart. Follow your heart. It's the, oh, that's the way to go. Follow your heart. The heart is deceitful. It's not the heart that you follow. It's the word of God. Verse 3. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. How come the, the majority of the people want to teach a rapture theory? Why is it that they are so fixed on a rapture theory? Because of popularity. Because people will pat you on the back. They'll slide money in your hand. They'll tell you what a great man you are. It's not about those things. It's not about the pride of life. It's not about uh, the encouragement of a man. If I want encouragement, I seek it from the Lord. When one teaches the Word of God, it must be in clarity. What these teachers are teaching, what it's talking about here in Ezekiel 13, they're not teaching the Word of God. They're teaching out of their own heart. They're traditions of man. These things that make void God's word. They take God's word and push it away. Well, what's so wrong, Brother Randall, about the rapture theory? Well, the rapture theory allows one to rest and not to study. The rapture theory gives people hope where there is no hope. People will sit down and lay down majority of your ministers that follow along with this type of teaching, they'll tell you, well, don't worry about the book of the Revelation uh, because chapter 4, we're already called away. The church is called home. That's a lie right straight out of the pits of hell. And what that does, that keeps a student of the Word of God, one of these little ones that he's talking about here in Matthew chapter 18, that no no more furthers their study. They don't go far enough to understand that they are to wait upon the Lord. They are to wait for Him. If one studies enough, they know that there is one coming, the great Assyrian. They know that there is one coming that is uh, the anti-Christ, the instead of Christ, and He comes when? He comes at the sixth trump, at the sixth vial, and at the sixth seal. That's 666. That's his number. That's when he comes. That's not the one that you wait upon. Here again, back in chapter 13 of the book of Ezekiel, verse 4, and he says, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the deserts. <laughs> verse 5. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. That's what needs to be taught. Friends, do you realize that there is going to be a battle? That there is a battle going on now? And the battle that is going on now and the battle for the near future, it's not of bombs and guns and, 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 and of a war. It's of the mind. It's about what you know to be the truth. In Revelation chapter 9 and verse 5, he says, told that the, of the scorpions, to, or excuse me, the locusts, to not harm those who have the seal of God in their forehead. Only take those who have not the seal of God. What is the seal of God? That where you 
understand the Word of God and where it comes to clarity for you, it's sealed in your mind. Sealed until the day of redemption. It's sealed for you to be able to stand and make that day. Verse 5, Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Again, that day is coming, and then it's going to be a battle. That hour of temptation, you want to know why God called it an hour of temptation? Because it is a temptation that will come upon the world. And when the Antichrist comes, in Daniel's prophecy, he's going to come in prosperously and peacefully. What's the opposite of prosperity and peace? You're seeing that today. Verse 6. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying the Lord, the Lord saith. And the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm their word. They have deacon boards and amen groups uh, just for that very reason. For when somebody says something, uh, oh, they're up and on it. Amen. Uh, oh, they're up and on it. And, and, and they agree with them. Not knowing what the truth is. This puts them all in the same condemnation. You say, well, I've not been a teacher. Uh, 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 but I've been to one of those churches that teaches rapture. I pray that you have repented. And you have changed your heart. That's true repentance, friend. When one changes their heart, they say, I'm not going back to a Beth of Inn. I'm not going to go back to a house of nothingness. I'm going to go where I can be taught. I'm going to go where God's Spirit is and where it, it leads me. Verse 7, Have you not seen a vain vision and have you not spoken a lying divination, whereas you say, the Lord saith? Albeit, I have not spoken. God says, I've not told you that there's going to be a, a calling away or a, 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 an any moment doctrine, a rapture theory. I've not told you that. What has God told us? To wait upon him. To wait upon the Lord. If you get nothing from this message this morning... Waiting upon the Lord is the most important part. To wait upon God. Verse 8, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. Against you for playing church. For playing emotions. Playing on the emotions of people. Back in Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 9, he said, and if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. Friend, I mean pluck it out. Get it away from you. And cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than to have two eyes and to be cast into the hell fire. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is written here, he says in chapter 5 and verse 1, he says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Isn't that coincidental that he speaks about children? He knows how precious the teaching is and how, how important it is how that the truth lands on fertile ground. Verse 2, And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanliness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. 4, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Verse 5 is why I came. For this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, 
nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. It's a serious thing. Teaching the word of God is a very serious thing. And it's not to be played with. These are lives of people. These are the souls of man and woman and little children that you are dealing with. And it's so important that they realize uh, that freedom that they have. Jesus said, if the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. When you expect Christ to save your soul from a, a devil's hell, that's exactly what he does. And once you have come to that point of your life where you've accepted Christ as your Savior, you move on and you get off of the milk and you get onto the meat of the Word and you begin to learn what it is God requires of you. His requirements are His statutes and His commandments and that you wait upon him. Verse 10. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. When falsely teaching a young Christian, it's brought to the attention of God. Don't ever let it be said that God didn't know or uh, 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 they told them in secret how these things they thought they were going to happen about a rapture theory or an any moment doctrine. Friend, God knows about it. Let's move on. Verse 11. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. We read that in Matthew chapter 15, did we not? Matthew 15 and verse 24. What did he say he came to do? He said, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's whom he's come for. He's come for those that were lost. Lost and undone. That did not know. Kind of like the Ninevites. They didn't, they couldn't discern their left hand from the right. They didn't know. But once Jonah preached to them salvation unto God, they repented. Verse 12. How think you, question, if a man have a hundred sheep and one of them be gone astray, doeth he not leave the ninety and nine and goeth into the mountains and seek that which is gone astray? Well, sure he does. If he didn't, he wouldn't be a good shepherd. Sure he does. His concern is that one that is gone. Verse 13, And if so be that he find it, verily, in other words, truly, I say unto you, he rejoiced more of that sheep than of the ninety and nine which went not astray. When one is brought back into the fold, when that prodigal son comes home, that parable that is spoken about, about the prodigal son, where was the father? He was sitting there on the porch, looking down the road. Every day, he looked for him to come back. He looked for him, his son, to come home. And that's the same way that God is with his children. God is the same way. He wants you to come home. Come back to where you belong. Those that had fallen away, those that had, that had let the world entertain their thoughts and, and do what they want to do. Friends, this world is an evil place. And it destroys a lot of good men and women. And God is doing his best to try to draw his children this morning. Verse 14. Even so it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. 
Father doesn't want his children to fall by the wayside. Even over here in 1 Peter, we see here, or excuse me, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number, number 9. says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Aren't you glad that God's long-suffering? Boy. If we were to get what we deserve, none could make heaven their home. For the Bible says that none are good, no, not one. But my Father, which is in heaven, he is a long-suffering God. That's why you and I need to be Christ-like as much as possible. To judge not that man or that woman. Judge them not. The Word tells us judge not before their time. We do not know the heart of an individual. We do not know whether or not they have repented and went and spoke with God. But he says here again in verse number 9, he says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He didn't say shall come to repentance. He said should come to repentance. As in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't say shall not perish. You see, there's a free will in there. And this is what your conduct is graded upon. This is where you are graded as being one of God's children. Knowing good from evil. Turning from the ways of this world. Getting away from the things of this world. And turning your heart to God. Back in Matthew chapter 18 verse 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. And if he shall hear thee, uh, thou hast gained thy brother. Now, this word brother, this is one of the brothers or sisters of the tribe of Israel. That's what they're talking about. So he's saying here, if your brother uh, that has trespassed against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Don't go and make it public. Go to him alone. If he shall hear thee, then ye have gained a brother. If he recognizes his fault, then you have gained a brother. You have gained one that will stand with you and that will help you. For the proverb says that iron sharpeneth iron. So do a brother sharpen the countenance of another. Verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. In other words, uh, not to bring somebody over to bully him. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that when you are speaking and he is speaking, that you also have a witness that he either accepted it or he didn't. Verse 17, And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. If you've done all that you can, short of taking that person to court over the situation that you are in. God doesn't want you to go into civil court and to sue your brother or sue your sister. That's not what God's will is. 
God's will is that they understand and come to the knowledge of the truth. And when they do, then their minds are opened. They have cleaned out all of the evil, and they have accepted the truth. Verse 18, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whosoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, as we have said before, that loosing these things on earth is as teaching the word of God. These things that bind a person, these things that have a claw in them. And it, they've heard it in a church. They've heard it from a minister or from a teacher. But it's something that they can't live. And they realize it. They say, well, Golly, I, I, I can't live it. I, there's no reason, no reason for me to even try. I can't be good enough to make heaven my home. Bing! You're right. You can't be good enough. You cannot be good enough. What you must do is accept Christ as your personal Savior and to follow him. John chapter 15, he said, If you abide in me... I will abide in you. It takes following the steps that Christ took. It takes following after how he directed his life. And if we do those things, then God is pleased. Verse 19. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. The first thing to realize is who is he talking to? He's speaking to the disciples at this time. He's talking to the disciplined ones. He's speaking to you. Now, he's not saying that if you ask God for a, a, a million dollars or uh, uh, if two of you agree and, hey, uh, we'll split this million dollars and God will give it to us. That's not what he's saying. Not, not at all. He's saying about the ministry. If you have a desire in that to further your ministry and to do God's will, that where two or three that touch one thing, in other words, bring up this one subject before God, and if it prospers God's work, then God will be there. It shall be done. And God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness. But he's long-suffering, isn't he? Thank God for that. Amen. Verse number 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It's not about Large numbers. Although the world would like for you to think, well, ah, goodness gracious, uh, that little church down there, they, they don't have hardly anybody come. and uh, They aren't doing anything for the Lord. Uh, uh, but, but, but we are. Uh, we've got a parking lot and had to buy more property for another parking lot, and we've got all kinds of people coming. In other words, we have to have two and three services a day to be able to house all these people. Now tell me whether or not we're not doing right. If you're not teaching the word of God, friends, you're not doing right. If you are not leading the people the way that God expects you to be able to lead them, then friends, there is a condemnation coming. There is a payday that's going to be coming one day. It's not about the numbers. He said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. It's, the, it's the, the simplest form of the church in that day. I've had some of my best discussions about the word of God out in the parking lot where there would just be two or three of us standing there. Man, I mean to tell you the power of God come down. And these people were like, I've never heard it that way before. Tell me more. Tell me more. Well, I, I, I need to go. I need to 
trying to get to the house. But uh, uh, one more thing, <laughs> and before you know it, hours have passed, and the sun is going down. But God is still in the midst. That's how he works. Verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times, question. Peter was a realist, and he understood how people thought. And he thought to himself, you know, if I, I throw in this seven, it ought to be plenty enough. It ought to be enough. It, 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 you know, if I forgive him seven times. Verse 22, Jesus saith unto him, I say unto, unto thee, until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Wow. 490 times that you're supposed to just forgive your brother? Now listen to me. Listen to me real close. You're not supposed to let people just walk all over top of you because you're a Christ man or a Christ woman. That's not what he's saying. The criteria here is if they repent. If they repent seven times 70 in one day, if they repent every time, then by sure, forgive them oh it's so much easier to forgive than it is to harbor something in your heart against your brother or sister it's so much more important that to forgive but friends you can't just let somebody con you and and take over your life uh, uh, because you're a christ man or because you're a christ woman many people love to take advantage of christians Many people love to take advantage because they have a good heart and a good nature. Well, what do you mean? I, 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 don't, want to, I don't want that donut and that cold glass of water. I'm wanting $20. Well, I, I, that ain't what I've got. That's not what God has laid out for you to have. I'm here to help you if you want the help. God is very stern about people taking over. And as we get on through here, you're going to see that God doesn't like a con. There's a lot of people out here today that are conning people. And God doesn't like a con. Verse 23, Jesus says, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take an account of his servants. Now he's speaking here uh, of God and his kingdom. Verse 24, and when he had begun to reckon, uh, one uh, was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot, friends. That's a lot. 25. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children, and all that he had, and pay payment to be made. Now, if you've got a debt close to a million dollars, and there's no way that you can pay that, for restitution of the king, the king says, well, have him to be sold, and have his wife to be sold and have his children to be sold, and all the belongings that he has. You see what deceitfulness does to a family? A deceitful heart in a family member, the head of the house, if that one is a deceitful person, then everybody in that house is virtually the same. But if one is a Christ man... And he lays out a criteria of how things are going to be done in his home. People that live in his home will follow that. Not that it's a dogmatic way. Not that it's a, a, a way in that to uh, my way or the highway. But what he's saying here is, is that if you love the Lord and you show your love. Friends, we teach and we give out instruction 
to those who watch and pay attention. In other words, when one is at a place in their life and they want to help others, uh, you lead by experience. You lead by guidance. Verse 26. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. This man recognized that he had a debt, and he wanted to pay all that he had. Verse 27, then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him his debt. Compassion is needed in the ministry. Without compassion, you have nothing more than just a lecture. You must have compassion for the individual. You must know how they feel. You must know how they work. And you must know what offends them. This compassion that came to God at that time is because that heart of that individual said, Hey, I've made a mistake, and I need God to forgive me. That's called true repentance. That's what God expects of you and I. Verse 28, But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence, and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Goodness gracious, that doesn't seem like a Christ man to me. He's went and turned on somebody that just owes him a little bit. And he owed the king uh, thousands, uh, uh, 10,000 talents. Where does that make it right? Verse 29. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Uh, I believe that's what he said in verse 26, was it not? Have patience with me, and I'll pay you all. Verse 31. Excuse me. Verse 30, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. In other words, he had no compassion. He had no compassion for this individual, even though this man was begging, knowing that he had the overhand over him. He begged him, please give me time and I will pay you. But he had no compassion whatsoever. Verse 31, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. 32. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that thy debt, because thou desirest me. God says, I forgave you. I gave up all that I had to allow. I gave up this million dollars, per se, to allow you to go free because I had compassion for you. I loved you. Verse 33, Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee, question? Yes, he should have. He should have had compassion and shown his compassion. 34, and his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, in other words, to the jailers, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So that debt came right back on him, didn't it? Every bit of it came right back on him. Why did God do that? 
because this individual was trying to con God. He was trying to con him. He said some precious words like, oh, please. Or uh, have patience with me. Please. So often, the cons of the world will use that word please. 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 And then when they have it, they have what they, they just throw it from one corner to the other and have no desire what they do with it. Because they didn't earn it. They didn't work for it. All they had to do is say, please. The magic word, as one would say. God doesn't like a con. The good thing about God is, is that he doesn't look on the outward part of a man, but he looks on the inward part. A man or a woman, he knows their hearts, and he knows exactly what they are doing and what they are saying. Verse 35, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. What a valuable lesson. What a valuable lesson it is for us to forgive our brothers when they repent. And you say, now, how am I supposed to know that they've repented or not? When they repent to you. When they tell you, I am so sorry. This is my actions and this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to make it right. Friend, there's a lot to be said about an individual that says they're going to do something and they do it. That's their word. Very few people are valued of their word anymore. Very few people are valued of their word. They, they want to go into contract and they want you to sign this and have lawyers involved and, and all these other things. And then, oh, just to make sure that, uh, that, that I don't get beat. The Bible teaches us that if we were to lend, you're not to, supposed to expect it back. And if it does come back to you, that's a blessing. Let that be a lesson to you. If you have a desire to lend somebody something or give to someone, do it with a whole heart and don't expect anything back. And so your feelings are not going to get hurt when you don't get it back, when you don't receive it. But if it does come back, and friends, you've gained a brother. You've gained one that you can trust. That's chapter 18. I believe I'm going to stop right there this morning. Chapter 18 in the book of Matthew. We'll be picking up back in chapter 19. But I want to say this morning that the lessons that Christ has taught us is that we are to stand on our own two feet and to be Christ men and Christ women, not to allow the world to beat you down and take advantage of you just because you are a Christian. But you are to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. He expects us to know how to handle these situations in our life. We appreciate you. Thank you again for being a part of our Bible study this morning. If we've helped you, would you help us, would you? We appreciate you. Pray for Fresh Start, would you? And also, I want to make an announcement. Uh, that this month of September, on the 24th, that's the last Sunday in the month of September, we will be having our Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, we will be having Holy Commune uh, directly after the service, and we'll be having it live. So if you can come, oh, we would love to have you. We'd love to have you here. But if it's too far and you're not able to come, Maybe you can have commune with us and be a part of our service. And uh, if you would, you get your items ready uh, for commune service and uh, be a part of that, would you? We appreciate you. Thank you again for being a part of Fresh Start's 
Bible study hour. Until the next time, may the Lord richly bless.